one of the issues I think is that men actually don't know that there are treatments out there. Yeah, so they, exactly. They, and they convince themselves and society convinced them that, well, actually it's part of age and therefore it's natural and therefore, we, and, there, and there isn't anything you can do. You might be able to take tablets, but there's nothing else. But actually yeah. one of the beauties of something like this is that we'd hopefully be able to show that there is always something that we can do. And Hi everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Today we are talking about erectile dysfunction. This is a problem that is pretty common in men, but one that may remain untreated for some time due to embarrassment in coming forward. Joining me today is Professor Ian Pearce, consultant urological surgeon and president of the British Society of Urological Surgeons. He is widely published and is an expert in this field. Ian, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you, Gail. Thank you for having me. Very uh, excited about the podcast today. Wonderful. So, Ian, as you know, this podcast is aimed at educating patients. So we try to avoid medical terminology as far as possible so that it remains as accessible as possible to everyone. Yeah. So let's start with the very basics. What exactly is erectile dysfunction? Thanks. So the, the working definition of erectile dysfunction is the inability to get an erection and keep an erection sufficient for a patient to engage in sexual activity. So it could be it could be either, it could be or, or of course it could be both of those issues. Okay. And um, so the symptoms are exactly that. Can you explain how what men may experience? Yeah, so men usually either experience the fact that they their penis doesn't get hard enough. They don't get a full erection the way they used to. Or mm -hmm. they may get an erection, which is maybe as good as previously, but actually then just doesn't last as long as it, it as they would be used to. And of course, okay. or a combination of the two. Okay. And are there any risk factors for developing erectile dysfunction? Is there anything, for example, that men can do to reduce their risk of this happening to them? Yeah, I mean, the short answer to that is yes to both. In terms of risk factors, pretty much anything uh, really is potentially a risk factor. So the, the biggest risk factor is the thing that we can't do anything about, and that is getting older. So we know that yeah. as men get older, the risk of erectile dysfunction increases to the extent that in men over 70, approximately half of men might have trouble with erections. So that's the biggest risk factor. Other things such as high blood pressure, uh, whether or not there are patients on treatment or high cholesterol levels, uh, diabetes, these are all risk factors. As well as those medical issues that may pose a risk factor, different tablets and different medications that a patient may be on can also impact negatively on their erections. So quite a lot of the medications that may be used to treat high blood pressure can also impact on, on erections and make a man uh, suffer from erectile dysfunction. In terms of what can a man do to try and minimise those risks or improve erectile function, it really is about having a healthy lifestyle. So no smoking, only moderate alcohol, and of course, a, a good, decent amount of exercise. And we would normally recommend about three episodes of exercise around about 40 to 50 minutes duration of each time. So it's all about keeping healthy uh, and minimising those risk factors that might cause erectile dysfunction, really. So that advice, um, I always say that's the same advice I have every single podcast that I do, uh, because you know, they're the common, common ways, lifestyle ways to improve your life in general and decrease the onset of pretty much all illnesses, I would say, or most illnesses, yeah. um, apart from genetic ones, I guess. Um, but that advice, is that advice to minimise the risk of getting these conditions that would cause erectile dysfunction or does it have a direct impact or do we not know? Well, well it's actually pretty much both. So if we know that if you live a healthy lifestyle, you are less likely to primarily, of course, because you're less likely to run into trouble with other with other diseases. So, for example, yeah. if you are if a man is overweight, we know they are more likely to develop type two diabetes. And we know that patients with type two diabetes are much more likely to develop erectile dysfunction. And, and of course, then the reverse goes true that if you are a man who has a, a high weight and or may have developed type 2 diabetes and you then lose weight 
and your, mm-hmm. or, or even if you improve your diabetes control, then your erectile function will improve. All right. Okay. Okay. So that goes to what men can do to reduce their risk. Yeah, absolutely. And all of the guidelines would recommend lifestyle modification in order to try and reduce progression of erectile dysfunction, but also to try and reverse the trend if possible as well. Okay. Now, in my introduction, I mentioned that um, it's a condition that I imagine, um, I'm, a, I'm a gynecologist, of course, so my patients are all women, but it's a condition that I imagine may be diagnosed late or men may feel embarrassed to come forward. Is that true? It is true. And fortunately, that, that trend is slightly reversing, but still not reversing at the pace that we would like. So by and large, men are not particularly at ease with talking about sexual function. Uh, they're not yeah. particularly at ease with talking to other men or indeed their partners. But yeah. and, and that, I think, is really a sort of historical taboo, if you like. But but things are definitely changing and we see increasing number of men come to clinic with their partners. We see increasing number of men who have who come to clinic as a result of having a discussion with one of their friends you know, elsewhere who have also may have suffered from it erectile dysfunction so we are gradually turning the tide on that but yes you're quite right there's no doubt that by the time people have been to see their gp for help and then be referred on to our service they've usually had erectile problems for for a good number of years yeah okay and and that's really one of the aims of me doing these podcasts yeah. because it just makes it easier to reach some people some populations that are more difficult to reach um some conditions that might seem to be embarrassing to go and talk about you know if it's just on your phone or something you can get information and that can kind of give you along to go and seek help yes and i think and one of the so, sorry again one of the one of the issues i think is that men actually don't know that there are treatments out there yeah so they, exactly they, and they convince themselves and society convince them that well actually it's part of age and therefore it's natural and therefore we, and, there, and there isn't anything you can do you might be able to take tablets but there's nothing else but actually yeah. one of the beauties of something like this is that we'd hopefully be able to show that there is always something that we can do and there are lots that's of fantastic news options. that's great that's great and i think another one of the barriers in addition to embarrassment and apart from embarrassment i think another one of the potential barriers to accessing health care is that people don't know what to expect yeah. So my next question is, how is erectile dysfunction diagnosed? If a man has these symptoms that you have described earlier and he goes along to his GP, what can he expect? What investigations are performed? Um, what can he expect? And, and that, you know, just removing that shroud um, yeah. sometimes yeah. will give people some courage to go in. Absolutely. I mean, I think both you and I and anyone in medicine knows that it's often the fear of the unknown that prevents people coming yes. forward. So I think if a man with erectile dysfunction presents to the GP, I think they can expect a thorough workout. Um, in other words, they'll have their full history taken, looking for all of those risk factors that we that we talked about, whether the patient may have yep. diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, that sort of thing. Um, they, in terms of making a diagnosis, actually the patient makes the diagnosis. Um, if the patient says they've got erectile dysfunction, they have erectile dysfunction. So it is the doctor's job to work out risk factors that may be modifiable. So the undiagnosed diabetes patients, that sort of thing. And then they can expect an examination. And when, when patients are examined, we're really looking to assess whether they have the so-called secondary sex characteristics. So uh, do they need to shave? Have they got normal distribution of body hair? Okay, have they got normally developed uh, external genitalia? Uh, so mm-hmm. making sure that they examine the penis and the testes to make sure the testes are of normal size, because, of course, the test, the testicles, the testes make the testosterone and without testosterone, we don't have erections. So they can expect a thorough examination. They will also pr- almost certainly have their blood pressure checked to ensure they haven't got high blood pressure. And in terms of investigations, I, I think it's it would be routine and usual to have blood tests. And that could, again, be looking for abnormal blood sugar levels which may be a a marker of diabetes also looking Mm -hmm. for cholesterol levels and in instances where patients may not have normal distribution of body hair or perhaps low test low volume testicles they may also have a hormone profile as well Uh, and for that we would check their testosterone 
and a, and a couple of hormone levels that are responsible for controlling testosterone release. Okay. And this can be expected to be done at the GP or is that in secondary care after they're referred to someone like yourself? I think the honest answer to that, Gail, is that it very much depends. It, it would be reasonable to have... It, yes, yes it, it's pretty variable. In, in some places and in some practices, that would be done in primary care, yes. In others, they might leave the hormone testing, for example, to secondary care once they've referred. So it does vary a little bit. Okay. And if, again, if someone has these symptoms, so, you know, they're having these symptoms, they yeah. see you on this podcast and they go along to their GP um, and they see the GP and they, then they refer to you. Um, what happens then? What happens after you see them? In other words, what are the treatment options that are available? And yeah. of course, it depends on the cause, but um, can you just talk us through what options yes. might be uh, available? Yes, of course. So I would say the first instance, when, the, when a patient goes to the GP, they could quite reasonably expect that the GP would start treatment. And that would usually be in the form of a, of a tablet. So okay. uh, your listeners will be aware of the, the magical blue pill that that is Viagra, or the trade name of Viagra, which is called uh, Sildenafil. So there mm -hmm. are three or four different brands out there, and it would be perfectly reasonable for the GP to commence patients on the Sildenafil. So usually we would then get, they would get referred to us once they've tried the Sildenafil tablets, and that has failed to produce an adequate response. Okay. When when they then were referred to our service, we would usually uh, ensure that they'd had all those blood tests done, in particular their testosterone and the, the other regulatory hormones. And then we would offer them a choice of treatment. So if a person doesn't have success with oral tablets, then there are a multitude of other options they could try. There are creams that are applied to the head of the penis. There is a, a small pellet which is inserted into the uh, into the tip of the water pipe through the penis. There are injections that patients can be shown how to perform, so they would self-inject the penis. Okay. There is a vacuum device, which is a little bit a little bit like a breast pump, except mm -hmm. obviously designed for the penis. And it just creates a vacuum, which then brings blood in and then gets trapped uh, when the erection has been created. And then finally, of course, we have surgery. We can we have penile implants or penile prostheses, which we are able to implant to restore a, a man's ability to get a stiff penis through a purely mechanical mechanism. So we would really try and look to explain all of those to the patient. We would obviously re-examine, et cetera, to make sure that uh, everything was okay. But to all intents and purposes, we would then offer the patient all of those. We would try and counsel them regarding why they may choose one or the other, what the drawbacks of one might be, or the, or the drawbacks of none of the advantages. And we would hopefully come to a decision um, with the patient that, to take things forward for them. Okay. And again, if, if someone had these symptoms, um, yeah. how quickly would you, you know, you said that in most cases, by the time they come to you, this has been going on for years. Yeah. Um, how quickly would you encourage men to come forward for treatment, apart from for quality of life reasons, um, does the prognosis or does the effectiveness of treatment uh, improve if you come along earlier? If that makes yeah, sense, it does make sense, and it's a, and it's a great question. But it it, it almost, um, I suppose, at this juncture, it would be it would be useful for me to offer a bit of a division because it very much depends. There are a, there's a large group of patients who are not exactly almost too young to have anything else wrong, but who are mm. plagued by actually what we call performance related anxiety. So yeah. their erectile function from a, a physiological anatomical way works, but actually their anxiety around sexual encounters is so great that it's that that causes the erection either not to um, come yeah. as hard as it should or go away too early. And for, for that group of patients, actually, if it's a recurrent theme, then, of course, the earlier, the better, because if, it, if, if the erection doesn't uh, perform the way it should in one occasion because of anxiety, the next time the patient comes to try, there's even greater levels of anxiety. So well, it soon snowballs out of control. Um, as, as all of us 
uh, increase in age and we dis and, and our when the erections start to tail off again once they've started to diminish i think from a from a quality of life perspective the sooner the better does it mean that you are less likely to respond to various interventions i don't know that we really do have that evidence base to be able to say that truly because what we haven't done is ever mapped patients from the beginning to yeah. later on without treating them of course so it's almost an impossible thing to know but I, I think fundamentally, like most things in medicine, the earlier the better. Yeah, absolutely. OK. And in view of what you've just said, um, does psychology play a mm. significant role, any role in the treatment process? Yes, it does. And I think it's it, I think it's fair to say that there is always a psychological element to erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And the, and the yeah. key then is to figure out whether it's the dominant or, or indeed a major factor or whether it's part and parcel of the fact that of course none of us none of us want the thought of having erectile dysfunction so if it is a dominant factor or a major factor then you're quite right we would also en enlist the help of our psychosexual counseling colleagues and, and they would they usually they would see both the patient and the patient's partner and spend quite a significant amount of time going through therapy which is usually very very good very successful okay and you said that, um, you know, it's good for men to come along because there are several treatment options, which I had no idea. You've listed so many things there. Um, do you think that um, most men can be treated successfully? What, what, is, what, what is the kind of success? How successful can yeah. treatment be? What are the I kind of almost, success rates, if you know? Yeah, I think almost all men, depending on how far they'd like to go. So if you were to take, for example, a penile prosthesis, which is the operation to yeah. insert a mechanical device into the penis, which then is mechanically mm -hmm. operated, that has a patient success rate of around about 95%. So, wow. but it is a big operation and, it's a, and, it's a, and it can be a difficult journey and there are complications. But a patient satisfaction of 95%, that's pretty unusual, I'd say. So I think virtually everybody can be helped. If you're looking at success rates for injection therapy and vacuum therapy, you're really, you know, you're looking at 80% plus. Uh, and we would we would usually quote the same for things like sildenafil. So all of the oral tablets, uh, mm. in reality, have a very good and high success rates. Okay. And are there any factors that influence success rates? Uh, Apart yes. from, I guess, what you said, healthy lifestyle, etc. Yes, there are. So we we know that patients with diabetes, for example, have a slightly lower success rate. Uh, we also know that if, for example, a patient's had uh, pelvic surgery so they may have had their prostate removed or their bladder removed for, for for cancer then we also know that their success rates are diminished in terms of using the the tablets and they would often have to go on to injection or even vacuum devices okay okay and um what are the risks or side effects of treatment so so we've all been you know watching whatever on telly 10 o'clock at night and these ads come up um for tablets can that can be i don't know i guess ordered and delivered to you um are there any risks of just ordering these and taking them um well is it something that needs to be prescribed what are the risks of treatment so the tablets have almost always been available now we've got the internet and that used to be that pretty much the biggest reason why the tablets failed is because the patients didn't really get what they should have been getting because it was all right it should have been on prescription uh, things like uh, sildenafil are now available over the counter as as you, as Viagra Connect. Um, there's no real reason why a man should have to buy them. They're very expensive, and they're all they are available on the NHS free of restrictions. So that shouldn't ever happen. Having said that, I think now most of, because it is available over the counter, most preparations, provided they're properly labelled and you know is the, the proper trade name, then I think that's that's that is okay. But yes, you're right. There are side effects. And I guess one could easily argue that because things are if things are available over the counter, then the side effect profile is is, is quite limited. But people mm. do get uh, nausea. They can get pounding headaches. They get facial flushing with certainly with sildenafil. You can also get visual disturb temporary visual disturbances. Um, and you've got to be careful as well with with most, but not all of the tablets when and how you take them. So you, you shouldn't take them with fatty food and alcohol because it delays their absorption. And of course, then you don't get the full dose. So again, they're more likely to not work. 
Okay. And any significant risks or side effects? Well, there are always risks in terms of surgery, but with the injection or the vacuum yeah, apparatus? Think, yes, absolutely. And, and the thing that people often cite as the reason for discontinuing both of those interventions mm. is simply that it, it, it lacks the spontaneity. So yeah. the scenario for both the vacuum and the, in, well, the scenario for the vacuum, of course, is that when the situation arises, you have to disappear, you have to put the device on, you've got to generate the erection, and you've got to put a, a ring on the base of the penis in order to keep the blood in. So it How takes away that, that. Well, to be truthful, it doesn't take too long. It takes a few, but it can take, you know, four or five minutes for them to get the kit out and everything, yeah. and everything else. So it isn't the most spontaneous thing. The And people find it a bit cumbersome. And the other thing to say, particularly about the vacuum, is that it only impacts on the visible part of the penis. And uh, listeners may not be aware that the penis, the tissue of the penis actually is the visible part and also a part deep in the pelvis, which anchors the penis. And that is involved in natural erections, but it doesn't obviously get involved when an erection mm -hmm. is produced from a vacuum. So it can be slightly unstable in terms of moving around. It's not quite so um, stable in that respect. The other issue with the vacuum is that it brings in venous blood. So it brings in blood that's had its oxygen already removed. So and that that blood is slightly cooler. So rather than having a very a warm erection, which is would, would natural, it's a slightly cooler erection. So it, it doesn't quite feel as natural as, as men and their partners might be used to. Um, okay. and, and the final thing to note, of course, is that they have to use a penile ring, which is a a thick rubber elastic band which goes to the base of the penis to hold the blood in but that also occludes the urethra the water pipe which means that when a man orgasms the semen doesn't come out and again that changes the perspective and changes the sensation ah. for, both, for both parties right in terms gosh of, that's fascinating in terms of the injection lots of men don't like the idea of injecting the penis every time they want to have sex which, which I think we can all understand, but actually the we injection is, that. yeah, but, it, but it's a very fine, fine uh, needle. It's very well tolerated. Uh, but again, it lacks that spontaneity because you have to, when the situation arises, you have to disappear. You may have to make up the solution, you inject, and then you have to wait up to 20 minutes for it to actually work. Oh, gosh, so, right, okay, yeah. Again, it, 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 it's great, but, it, but it's not quite as natural as, as, as we're all used to, mm -hmm. yeah. And is it injected into the base of the penis or the tip injected, or anywhere? It's injected, uh, yeah, so injected along the shaft of the penis. So the bits to right. avoid is the top and the bottom. Underneath the penis, of course, where the water pipe is, we need to avoid. Yeah. And the bit on the top, yeah. that's where all the nerves and the blood vessels run. So it's usually at the side, either okay. side. And they, and they would injection. vary the side. Yeah, just Two one injection. Just one. just one because both of the erection cylinders communicate with each other. So you just have Connect. to get the chemical yeah. in. Yeah. Got yeah, it. And, and you mentioned um this is this is an education for me can you tell um and you mentioned there's a little bead that there is a pellet the yes pellet. so the same chemical that we inject is also available mm -hmm. in a cream and also in a mm -hmm. pellet the pellets actually not all that commonly used but there may be listeners out there who are already using it and that pellet is inserted about two inches or so with an applicator into the water pipe. So the right. chemical gets absorbed then through the ah. water pipe into the erection tissue. But that can cause a bit of burning in the water pipe, a bit, not, not dissimilar to the type of sensation that people may get if they get cystitis. Yeah, yeah, water infection, it, okay. Yeah, and it's available as a cream as well, but that cream is a, is a different dose and it just, the cream gets put on the head of the penis, it gets absorbed and then massaged in. And again, 20 to 30 minutes later, with sexual stimulation, we'd expect that to give it results. And do they work equally well, depending on the route, or is it? No, they. they it, to be the, truthful, they the, don't. Um, yeah, the injection yeah. is far more effective than yeah, the pellet. So. Yeah, which is a little bit more effective than than the uh, cream. Yeah. So if if I tell you the dose also differs in that the injection, the dose is anything some sort of five to forty units, whereas the actual um, pellet is between 200 and 300 units and the actual cream is two to three thousand wow. so it's not it's not quite as good as you know when you inject it straight in it's straight there yeah okay
Okay. And what about surgery? Well, surgery used to be considered the you... very, the very final thing, the very, the very last resort. But increasingly, of course, like all things, uh, men and their partners should be allowed to make a choice. And if a, yeah. if, a if a patient sits there and says, "I've heard everything, thank you," um, I'd like to have the operation. Then I, then I think that's reasonable. No other branch of uh, medicine or surgery do we insist on a patient having to do X, Y, and Z before they get to A. They that if they choose and they're appropriately counseled i think that's perfectly reasonable the mm -hmm. it is a big operation it's not done in many centers it, it's done probably in about a dozen centers in the country right and that involves essentially destroying the natural erection tissue the the, the erection tissue there are two cylinders as you know in the penis and they are covered in a capsule and those erection cylinders are like sponge and when a man gets erection those sponge that sponge fills with blood and makes the penis hard we destroy the sponge and we put inflatable cylinders in, in place. There is then a reservoir of fluid which goes in the abdomen, so the patient doesn't feel that. And then there is a pump which, which goes in the scrotum. It's a little bit like having a third testicle. And it's okay. just a mechanical device. The patient pumps it up, pumps their pump up in the scrotum. It takes the fluid from the reservoir in their abdomen. It fills up the cylinders and they obtain a stiff penis. So that can be done um, the national restrictions are that you have to have a certain ratio their body mass index has to be below a certain amount uh, so it has to be below 30 okay. so that's just a measure of their sort of relationship with their weight and their height uh, but by and large most people can achieve that and and it's a very mm -hmm. very successful procedure right fascinating and that stays in there for life it does, yeah. They have a lifespan around about ten to fifteen years, and if they if they fail for mechanical reasons, or, or then they can be replaced. They can be replaced. Okay. Yeah. So that that's yeah. the that's the sort of gold standard one where they pump up. There is another one which is is called a malleable or semi rigid prosthesis, which is a little bit like a very thick pipe cleaner. Those those sort of wire pipe cleaners that, that are always stiff, but you can bend them to a different direction. So they do exist for, and, and we predominantly use them for men who have, whose dexterous function isn't perhaps good enough for them to get hold of a pump. So, okay. so there really is no limit. So if a man comes in, they've got yeah. fairly profound arthritis, for example, then they could have a malleable prosthesis. So there is still a, a surgical solution, you know, even in that scenario. Okay. And risks associated with that operation? Yes. Again, you and I know that the risk-free operation hasn't yet been invented. So there are risks, there's a risk, <laughs> there's a risk of infection. And because it's an artificial material, if it gets infected, we, we can't clean it. Antibiotics won't work. We would end up yeah. having to remove the prosthesis, have a pause for three months and then put another one back in. So it, infection is the biggest, is our biggest risk really. And in patients who've never had any penile surgery of this sort, we would anticipate that that risk is very much less than five or even 2%. So it's low. Okay. There is a risk that the prosthesis will erode through. So it can come through the tip of the penis it, or the scrotum. The pump can come through the scrotum. And again, we, that's normally less than 2%. And then, of course, there's a risk of mechanical failure as well. Uh, and again, if that happens, we would replace immediately. And then there are a host of things that are common to most operations, pain, bleeding, that sort, that sort, that sort of thing. And it's, it can be quite traumatic because, of course, we're destroying something before we before we do anything else. So yeah. it, it's a rough couple of weeks. Uh, we expect most of our patients to be up and running there and using their prosthesis within about six weeks. And how long are they in hospital for? Well, again, that actually depends on where they live. Just because if they live within sort of 30, 40 minutes from us, then we would let them go home the same day. They'd have a small drain, right. which is a, a plastic tube going into a bottle to drain off any excess blood. And then we take that out back in clinic a few days later. It, again, because it's not done in every place in the country, if, a, if people have to travel, so if you're traveling over an hour, for example, it's not a particularly pleasant journey. So we would keep those patients in overnight and let them go the next day. Okay, right. Okay, that was shorter than I thought, actually. Um, perfect. And um, so that's 
blew my mind. Um, quite quite a few options, um, something for everyone, yeah. um, and very effective. And it sounds like risks are relatively relatively low. Complications are infrequent, so it all sounds really really promising. Um, my next question is: Do any of these procedures affect ejaculation? Now you mentioned about the ring, yeah, and blocking the water pipe and therefore you know ejaculation doesn't take place but yes. in the others is it like no uh, it, no no not at all so a penile prosthesis um orgasm ejaculation would be completely unaffected so that, that that's fine for injections again orgasm ejaculation should be completely fine if and same for tablets but if you use a tablet the, the um sorry the pellet that goes into mm. the water pipe that can cause mm -hmm. local inflammation and irritation so mm -hmm. they might they might mm -hmm. the patient may feel that but by and large with the exception of the vacuum you're quite right so, you know sensation orgasm ejaculation is is ineffective great perfect okay um so okay that's fantastic thank you so much for those extremely useful and informative answers um i have a few questions from listeners if you yeah. are okay for me to proceed absolutely with that. yeah fire away okay so i must stress at this point that it is very difficult to give specific and personal personalized advice without knowing the patient's full history examination findings investigation results etc so these answers should be viewed as a guide only and personal advice should be sought from one's own doctor. So our first question is, how successful is the penile implant surgery that we are currently doing? Fabulously successful. So I, <laughs> I, I, uh, <laughs> that doesn't help anybody, I know. Um, I mentioned before. I, I, I think, as we said before, it's, it's 90, 95% satisfaction rate and all of the satisfaction rates that we have as well from patients partners is also uh, around about 90 percent mm. so it, it is excellent although what i would stress is that that a lot of that data stems from a time when we really were sort of reserving penile prosthesis surgery to patients who had already tried every other treatment it, so it was, all, it was yeah. almost a step by step and so of course if you're a patient and you failed everything or, or rather everything else has failed you then anything you know yeah. anything that works is great i i don't want although there it's an excellent device it's an, a fantastically successful operation i think it's important to stress that it, it doesn't turn the clock back and give you the erection that a, a person had when they were 18. It, it it isn't that it's not it's not as good as a natural erection but it is fantastic yeah that's great okay um uh, dr gale I see your post come up for erectile dysfunction. I too have this problem now, along with Parkinson's disease. I take Ramipril and blood thinners, and I've just been told I've moved from pre-diabetic to type 2 diabetes. So a lot of the risk factors that you mentioned before. Yeah. It is really frustrating for me now, although my partner is really understanding. Is there anything or any treatment for this? I have tried... Not Viagra, but the other version from the GP. So that's what you mentioned before. It doesn't work. Okay. So what would be the options for that particular patient? Thank you. So it, it, it's a great, um, it's a great question because you're right. It does bring in quite a few things that we've talked about. I, yeah. I think to start with, I would probably try the cream because it's it's not invasive it's not going to impact on anything at all and it doesn't require yeah. any level of um of motor function so i would try the cream um which is the same chemical as i said as the injection that there's only one type of cream it's called vitaros so okay. and i would try that i would try the maximum dose of Vi vitaros perfect great thank you hi i can get an erection but it doesn't last it's better with Viagra, but I can't ejaculate. I have multiple sclerosis. Is there anything I can do about this? Uh, yes. The, the, I think that depends on what the primary aim is. Is the primary aim to have a, a good erection or is it to ejaculate perhaps for the, in, in order to conceive and, and, and have family? So 
it obviously with MS is a neurological issue of, yeah. of, of, for both issues. And, and it might well be that even if you get an erection, an ejaculation won't be possible. So there are there are ejaculation stimulators that can be used. And that is a little bit like a it's essentially the male equivalent of a vibrator. And that clasps onto the head of the penis and it vibrates and that will promote ejaculation sufficient for a, a patient to be able to have sperm and perhaps uh, conceive. In okay. terms of the erections, then all of those things that we had previously talked about would be complete, would be suitable. Be the, depending on motor function, of course, if prosthesis was going to be inserted then we would go for it we'd probably go for a malleable prosthesis unless the hand function was was still maintained but yeah yeah okay so it depends okay great so thank you ian those are all the listener questions so Pleasure. i just have one more question for you and that's a question for me yeah you've looked after many many men with erectile dysfunction in your career thus far given the opportunity what would you like to say to men who have found themselves having this issue? That is great, because I think we've always, all of us involved in uh, men's health, have that thought. And that is, don't feel embarrassed to come forward and have a chat. People will, when I, when I see people in clinic, they'll often say, oh, this, is, this is embarrassing for me. And whilst we understand that completely, um, what I would like to get out there is that, it's literally what we do day in, day out. And it's okay to feel nervous. It's okay to feel, it's okay to feel embarrassed, but we can, we can help pretty much everyone as, as I hope we've, we've talked about. So I, the one thing I'd say is please don't be embarrassed. You, you definitely are not alone. It's probably, it's probably the least exclusive club in the world. So <laughs> please, yeah. so please come, uh, don't delay. Yeah, I can I can certainly relate to that because it's the same, of course, with gynecology. You know, many women feel embarrassment and, and we think, well, this is why we are here. We're here to do this. We're here to help people with exactly this problem. So please don't feel embarrassed. Please come along and seek advice and seek help. Absolutely. So, Ian, the last thing to do is to say thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today on the show. My Thank pleasure. you for sharing your wealth of experience about erectile dysfunction, which I'm sure will benefit many, many men. Thank you for agreeing to support me in educating patients. And I'm very flattered that you've come onto the show because you are an absolute expert on this topic. But most of all, thank you so much for your years of hard work, dedication and your fine accomplishments in the field of erectile dysfunction and for helping so many men. Thank you, Ian. Okay, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me and, um, you know, best, very best of luck. Thank you.